Okay, today we plan to go through Esther chapter 9, victory for God's people. D-Day was a victorious day in regard to World War II. It involved the coordinated effort of land, air, and sea forces of the Allied armies, and it served as the largest amphibious invasion in military history as they stormed the beaches of Normandy, France. Within one month of that time, over 850,000 uh, soldiers, 148,000 vehicles, and 570,000 tons of supplies landed on the Normandy sh shores, leading to the surrender of the German Nazi forces within one year of that time. In today's passage, a D-Day of sorts takes place in the book of Esther, a day of triumph, incredible triumph. The very day when the people of God were to be exterminated, it has become a day of victory. The Jews are allowed by king's decree to gather together and to defend themselves from their enemies. As we go verse by verse through this chapter, we'll see their triumph and their cause for celebration, reminding us as believers in Christ of Jesus' triumph and of our cause for celebration. We've got a lot to celebrate. Specifically, we'll be highlighting some of the more uh, some of the dominant victorious themes that help us to stand strong that we see in this passage and apply to our lives as believers in Jesus Christ. So please stand. We're going to pray. Then we'll go verse by verse right through this passage. Father, I thank you for this chapter we're about to read and study and look at and ponder and apply to our lives. And Lord, speak to us, encourage us, strengthen us. We thank you for your word. It is so life-giving. It helps us to see clearly, and we just thank you for that. We commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, verse 1. It's a long chapter, so hold on. So now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred, in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. So we are in the twelfth month of the month of, it's the month of Adar, it's roughly February slash March, 11 months after Edict number one calling for the Jews' extermination, and nine months after Edict two calling for the Jews' deliverance. And now that day has come, it's finally come. This is the day when the enemies of the Jews had hoped to exterminate God's people. It's interesting how that age-old hatred of the Jewish people, and it still continues to this day. But the tables have been turned. The Jews are able to gather and defend themselves, according to Edict Number 2. And this day of defeat has been turned into a great day of victory. Verses 2 to 4. The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could withstand them because fear of them fell upon all people. And all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the, the uh, governors, and all those doing the king's work helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's palace and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai became increasingly prominent. So instead of getting slaughtered, the Jews gather to proactively defend themselves and no one can withstand them. In fact, great fear of them has come upon the Medo-Persian Empire, their people. A deep respect, a fear of Mordecai in particular, has come upon the various officials of the king. He's become a very powerful individual. Mordecai is Esther's cousin and guardian who would refuse to bow down to Haman and who Haman had planned to execute, and who God had miraculously spared. Now, Mordecai's fame and prominence are spreading. So, when we refuse to bow down to ungodliness, for Haman represents all ungodliness, God lifts us up at just the right time. We may have a tough chapter, we may shed some blood, but in the end, he has a way of lifting us up, either in this life or when we go to be with him, we'll be lifted up for sure. Remember that Haman was an Amalekite, a people who had a history of fighting against God. That was their history. They fought God's people in the wilderness. They picked off those who were 
older and weak behind, straggling behind, and very ruthless. So let's not bow down to anything that fights against God and against God's purposes. Let's not bow down to the Hamans who are, who are presented to us. Verses 5 through 10. Thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction and, and what they pleased with those who hated them. And in Shushan, the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Also, Parsha Datha, Delphin, Espatha, <laughs> Poretha, uh, Adelia, 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 Eridatha, uh, Parmashta, Erisai, Eridai, and Vajazatha, <laughs> the ten sons, oh, say that fast, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, they killed. But they did not lay a hand on the plunder. So God is using his chosen people, the Jewish people, to bring judgment on his enemies. 500 men in the capital city are killed and the 10 sons of Haman are killed as well. The judgment of God is very real, a response of wrath upon ungodliness. All who fight against God, like the enemies of God in this passage, um, and they do so their entire lives without repenting, will face judgment. So each one of us, if we fight God our whole lives, never repenting of our sin, never confessing it, we too will face the wrath of God. It comes upon each person. We are so thankful for Jesus because he took the wrath of God upon himself. So on the cross, he took God's wrath. So in some ways, it's like this incredible spiritual umbrella and we are protected from the wrath of God. It was redirected onto the cross and we're thankful. The Christian life is a life of surrender. And in the Christian life, the judgment of God, the wrath of God has been poured out upon the Son of God, Jesus, thus paying for our sins and making it possible for us to be spared. Now notice that the Jews, as per verse 10, are not taking any plunder, though the edict permits the taking of plunder. Their motive is not to gain material possessions, but to defend themselves to be tools, actually, of God's judgment at this time. Remember that 500 years earlier, King Saul had been instructed to judge the Amalekites and to take no prisoners and no plunder. But he had disobeyed, and it was Samuel who confronted him. What have you done? What's this bleeding of sheep that I hear? And so they were to be wiped out before they were to pay for their sins. Note that over 500 years earlier, that's, that's what happened. Now, King Saul had disobeyed, disobeyed by taking both prisoners and plunder, whereas the Jews here obey by taking no prisoners and by taking no plunder. So God is giving the Jews another chance to be faithful in an area of past unfaithfulness. God is very merciful. Verses 11 and 12, On that day the number of those who were killed in Shushan, the citadel, was brought to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel, and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your request? It shall be granted to you. Or what is your further request? It shall be done. So a report is brought to the king regarding the number of those who were killed in the capital city. The king informs Queen Esther and then asks her uh, what else is to be done. And let's read on verses 13 to 15. Then Esther said, If it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do again tomorrow according to today's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan and they hanged Haman's ten sons. And the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men at Shushan, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. So Esther responds to the king. She requests that this very special day of victory be extended one day in the capital city and that Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. They've already been killed, but hanged on the gallows, displayed for all to see. So the king honors her requests. Haman's ten sons are displayed, and there's another day of judgment, and that's been commanded. So on day two, another 
300 men are killed in the capital city. And again, the Jews choose not to take any plunder. Verses 16 and 17, the remainder of the Jews in the king's provinces gathered together and protected their lives, had rest from their enemies, and killed 75,000 of their enemies, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. On the 14th day of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. So outside of the capital city, 75,000 enemies of the Jews were killed on day one, none on day two, because that was a day of rest for them. And again, no plunders taken. You might say, man, what all this, all this carnage? Was this a good thing? No, it wasn't really a good thing. But the whole deal is each one of us, because of our sin, we are worthy of death. Each one of us are worthy of judgment. It's Jesus who saves us from judgment. And in the Old Testament, someone could become a believer in the God of Israel. They could choose to, to denounce their Amalekite background and their I hate the Jews background and I'm going to kill them if I can kind of background. And they were able to do that and a number of people from the Medo-Persian Empire became believers in the God of Israel. But those who were again being killed, they obviously were still still adamant on i want to destroy the jews i'm an enemy of god and so each one of us are deserving of the same judgment it's amazing that any one of us are saved and that's the deal when it comes to new testament the grace of god upon us verses 18 and 19 but the jews who were at shushan assembled together on the 13th day as well as on the 14th and on the 15th of the month they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness Therefore, the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled towns celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar with gladness and feasting as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. For the Jews inside the capital city, there were two days of victory followed by a day of celebration characterized by rest, feasting, and gladness. And for the Jews outside the capital city, there was one day of victory followed by a day of celebration, characterized likewise by rest and feasting and by gladness, by joy. In verse 19, we learn that the celebration outside the capital city is seen as a holiday. It's a time for sending presents to one another. And for a great deliverance has come, an awesome victory, and it is a time of celebration. And verses 20 to 22, and Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews near and far who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the days in which the Jews had rest from their enemies as the month which was turned from sorrow sorrow to joy for them and from mourning to a holiday that they should make them days of feasting and joy and sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor so Mordecai is issuing a second letter. The first letter had declared that uh, on the day of the Jews' planned extermination that they could instead gather together, defend themselves, and be spared. But now on this, for the second letter, it's being sent also to all the, actually this is being sent to all the Jews who are in the Medo-Persian Empire, and it's establishing an annual celebration specifically for the Jewish people involving the two days in the month of Adar in February slash March, roughly. This is to be a time to remember and to celebrate, to commemorate their incredible victory, the turnaround from extermination to being able to, uh, to take out uh, enemies who want to exterminate them. So instead of annihilation, they experienced rest from their enemies, their sorrow was turned to joy, and their mourning turned into a holiday. Thus they should celebrate with feasting and joy and with the sending of presents and with gifts to the poor. Verses 23 to 25, covering a lot of ground, hang in there. So the Jews accepted the custom which they had begun as Mordecai had written to them. Because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate, annihilate them and had cast poor, that is the lot, to consume them and destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot which Haman had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that he and his sons 
should be hanged on the gallows. So the Jews embrace this new custom, this time of celebration and remembrance. For their powerful enemy, Haman, had plotted to annihilate them. He had cast poor. That's a form of casting of lots, you know, sort of like rolling the dice kind of thing, uh, to determine the day of their destruction. But then Esther had intervened by coming before the king and pleading for her people. The king had then commanded that Haman and later his sons be executed. In fact, they had been hung on the same gallows that Haman had built for Mordecai, the faithful Jews. What goes around comes around. God has a way of turning the tables, highlighting his power, his sovereignty, and his mercy on his own people. Verses 26 to 28. So they call these days Purim, after the name Pur. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter, what they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them, that without fail they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time. That these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city. That these days of Purim should, be, should not fail to be observed among the Jews and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. So the name of this annual celebration is Purim, Purim. The plural form of Pur, which means lot, so Purim is the plural form of that. It's because of the encouragement of this letter, this letter of Mordecai, and because of what they've experienced that the Jews take it upon themselves to set aside two days of celebration each and every year. These two days fall on the same days when the, the Jews experience their amazing, incredible victory. So the inhabitants of unwalled cities, they celebrate Purim on the first day, and the inhabitants of the, walls, the walled cities, they're celebrating it um, as far as the first Purim. They're celebrating on the second day, and since they had an extra day to defend themselves. So there's day one, day two, and so two days are set aside for the ongoing holiday that is to take place from then on. Note that in verse 27, that all who would join them are included. So people are becoming Jews, and others are showing favor to the Jewish people. Also note in the verse 28, these days are kept throughout every generation so that they will always remember what God did in their midst. So even to this day, Jewish people worldwide celebrate the annual festival of Purim. It involves the public reading of the Megillah, the scroll containing the book of Esther, as well as mutual giving of gifts and food and drink and the giving of charity to the poor, a celebratory meal. It's a really good time, apparently. In addition, various customs may include the drinking of wine and the wearing of masks and costumes as part of that festival in remembrance of the hidden identities in the story of Esther. The story of Esther is an amazing book. It's an amazing story, just, and it really happened. <laughs> so Esther had kept her Jewish identity hidden, so sort of a masquerade, and her relationship with Mordecai, her cousin and guardian, hidden. So again, another form of sort of hidden identity. Also, Haman led Mordecai through the streets. So there was a swap of identity. Haman, the big shot, had to humble himself and, um, and, 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 and declare uh, honor to Mordecai. And when Haman was hung on the gallows reserved for Mordecai, that was a switch of identity. And when Mordecai was given the signet ring, that ring of authority and honor, formerly in the possession of Haman, a switch of identity. And of course, the number one hidden identity in the entire book is God is never mentioned in this book, but he's actively orchestrating everything. He's the ultimate hidden identity in the book of Esther. When Purim is celebrated, there are often dramas and plays and the composition of special songs and carnivals and class parties for children, as well as Purim puppet shows. During the public reading of the Megillah, and this is typically done in synagogues, 
at the mention of the name Haman, which takes place 54 times in this book. Boisterous hissing and stamping can be heard and the rattling of noisemakers. The kids love it. It's like, yeah, I heard that name Haman, boo. And they, they just really get into it. Apparently some rabbis have tried to put a stop to it, but to no avail, the celebration goes on. Preceding the festivities, the day before Purim, is often a day of fasting called the Fast of Esther in remembrance of the fasting and the mourning that preceded their deliverance. So let's never forget. Victories are especially something we celebrate because we remember how bad it was before that. And so we celebrate what Christ has done for us and that's because, man, my life before Christ was terrible. And, um, and that's part of the celebration. He's pulled us out of, out of the muck. And then verses 29 to 32. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihel, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews, to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus, with words of peace and truth, to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them. And they had decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning matters of their fasting and lamenting. So the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. So Queen Esther, the faithful young Jewish woman, a star, just a star is born here in this book. She writes words of confirmation with her full authority as the queen to confirm this letter written by her cousin and guardian Mordecai, who was a previous unknown as far as to the empire as a whole. And the letter that establishes, this is the letter that establishes Purim as the annual celebration. So um, Esther is confirming that this is the real deal and this is genuine. In verse 30, we see that this letter, along with Queen Esther's accompanying confirmation, they go all uh, throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to the entire Medo-Persian Empire. And these words are described as words of peace and words of truth. Instead of being destroyed, the Jews are able to live and, and, and thrive. Thus, they're words of peace. Instead of being lied about, the Jews are vindicated. Thus, they are words of truth. So words of peace and words of truth. In verse 31, we see that fasting and lamenting are part of the Purim experience as well. In memory of the fasting that took place prior to Esther approaching the king. And the, lament the, the, and the lamentation, the mourning that took place uh, as the Jews cried out, the remembering that and all, that all the pain that was involved. Let's never forget the pain. Let's not live there, but let's not forget the pain that we came out of and that Jesus has healed us of. In verse 32, Esther's words of confirmation are referred to as the decree of Esther. And thus they are documented in an ancient book archiving this experience. So there are four victorious themes we'll go through rather quickly uh, that come from this passage. Victorious theme number one is power. In verse 1, we see that the enemies of the Jews, they had hoped to overpower the Jewish people. But the opposite occurred in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. So similarly, the forces of darkness had hoped to overpower Jesus. But the opposite occurred, Jesus overpowered them. Jesus rose from the dead. A sinless human being, that's Jesus, had been wrongfully put to death. So that sinless human could take the death penalty in our place since he had no sin. He had not committed any sin. He could thus pay for our sin because he had none. So when he died, he took our death penalty. And because the rules of God's court had been broken, an innocent person should never die, a sinless person should never die, he was awarded damages. He was able to rise again from the dead himself because the underlying, the rule, the basic rules of how God set things up have, uh, have been violated. And C.S. Lewis said, death started working backwards. There was like a deep magic or deeper magic. Death started working backwards because an innocent person had died. So after, 
After Jesus rose from the dead, he declared something amazing. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's all authority. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Then he says, baptizing them. And he says, teaching them. And then he ends that section with, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. So Jesus has been given all power and all authority in heaven and on earth. Incredible power. And he commissions us with the power he gives us. He commissions us to go. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter says this, His divine power, God's divine power, has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So all of the power we need to live a life for godly, all the power we need to live a godly life has been given to us through Jesus Christ. Everything we need has been given to us. The forgiveness that's taken place, the indwelling Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit as we, as we surrender to him and say, fill me, you know, continue to fill me. And he gives us power from on high that we did not have before. There's things that I was able to say no to that I couldn't say no to before coming to Christ. There was power available that I never even knew existed. And it wasn't available to me because I wasn't yet a believer. But once I became a believer, it's like, whoa, this is amazing. This is an amazing journey that now he empowers those who were so weak in the past. So that's theme number one is power. Victorious theme number two is triumph. Triumph. On day one in the capital city, 500 enemies of the Jews are killed and the 10 sons of Haman. Outside the capital city, 75,000 enemies of the Jews are killed. On day two in the capital city, 300 additional enemies of the Jews are killed. So this is a total triumph, a D-Day of sorts for the Jewish people. Similarly, the resurrection of Christ was a total triumph. Total triumph. He was dead, but then he rose again from the grave. Here's what Jesus accomplished in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, triumphing over them in it. So Jesus publicly defeated the forces of darkness, publicly defeated them. He disarmed them. He took away their weapons by taking upon himself the penalty of sin. He, took, he paid for that penalty. That was the major weapon that the forces of darkness had upon each one of us. He made a public, public spectacle of them, like a conquering Roman general parading his defeated foe through the streets of Rome. That's what Jesus did to the forces of darkness. Jesus, Jesus triumphed over the forces of darkness in a very stark and amazing way. And for the believers, for the believer in Christ, we can live triumphantly as well. That kind of triumph is available to us. Um, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 56 and 57. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So death's stinger is sin. Look at it as a big B. And the stinger, the stinger is sin and it's hold over us. Sin's hold over us. That's the stinger of the forces of darkness. But God has removed the stinger. He took it off. He plucked it off of the bee. And so it no longer has its stinger because he fulfilled the Jewish law. The penalty of our sin has been paid. Believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and now we can live victoriously. We have a victory that's available to us. Paul, who's learned how to be content in all things, he said this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we can do anything that God wants us to do and God has commissioned us to do. We can do anything that he calls us to do. He gives us the strength to do it. That kind of triumph, that kind of victory is available to us. 
Do we always walk in it? No, unfortunately we don't. We get tripped up at times. But the believer does something amazing. We get back up again. And we confess our sins. And we receive forgiveness afresh. It doesn't resave us. We're still saved even when we mess up. But that, 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 that wall of um, that wall that separates us from close fellowship with God, that wall is torn down and we have a restoration of close fellowship with him. Triumph, incredible triumph. We cannot be kept down. And then victory, victorious theme number three is celebration. After their triumph, there was feasting and gladness. There was joy and the sending of presents to one another. They were, they were celebrating. This was a major party. Similarly, after the resurrection of Christ, there's much joy. Jesus, who was dead, is now alive. And it didn't take people very long to realize just what good news that was. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ when he finishes, or Annie finishes with these words. He says this in Acts 2, verses 40 and 41. Be saved from this perverse generation. He's declaring this to the people who've gathered and saying, hey, these people must be drunk or something. He goes, no, the the Holy Spirit's been poured out. So be saved from this perverse generation. Come out from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his words were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. So salvation in the midst of a perverse generation. Sound familiar as far as today? It's like perverse generation, come out from it and turn your back on the world and serve the Lord. Our youth group is called Club 180 because we're turning our back on the world and we're serving the Lord. Club 180. So what good news. What joy. Incredible joy. 3,000 people just happy, happy to receive the good news of Christ. And the joy that we have in Christ is constantly available to us. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul's saying always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So even when we don't feel like rejoicing, we can rejoice. We're aligning ourselves with what God has done. He's given us an incredible victory. And he pours out his grace upon us day by day. And so we can choose to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So emphasis said twice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. So let's let our gentleness be known to everyone. Be evident to all. The Lord is here. He's near, here, he's at hand. So we're exhorted to rejoice. And in the following verses, the verses that follow this, to not worry, but to learn how to pray and to walk in peace. That's what God wants for us. So that's victorious theme number three, is celebration. And then finally, victorious theme number four is remembrance. In this chapter, Mordecai writes a letter to all the Jews establishing a two-day annual holiday called Purim, a time to remember what God has done. It's a time of feasting, a time of gladness, the giving of presents to one another, and the giving of gifts to the poor. For us as believers... We've been given a regular time to remember what Christ has done. Guess what it's called? It's called communion, the Lord's Supper. It's a regular time, what we just celebrated. It's a wonderful time to say, Lord, I remember what you've done. And I celebrate. It's a celebration. It's a remembrance. And it's a special thing that God has put in place, Jesus put in place for each one of us. As we focus in on what Jesus has done for us, it leads to the confession of sins, And it leads to uh, renewed joy, wonderful renewed joy. It also foreshadows the marriage supper of the Lamb, that time of feasting and gladness that we'll experience, that believers will experience after we've been gathered up to be with him. And we look forward to that. May each one of us, and may each day for each one of us, be a time of remembrance. David said in Psalm 25, verse 6, He said, remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses, for they are from of old. So let's remember God's mercy. Let's remember his compassion, his love, and his kindness. And the Lord himself, of course, remembers that. That's who he is. And 
Let's remember that on a regular basis. When we remember, it strengthens our faith and it triggers action. Like the Israelites who give presents and then they give gifts to the poor, they take action because they're so full of joy over what has taken place, the deliverance that God has brought about. As we remember what Jesus has done for us, it gives us an incredible desire to give gifts, presents, to be a blessing to others using the spiritual gifts that God has given each one of us, and each believer has at least one spiritual gift, using those gifts to be a blessing one to another, blessing the poor, blessing those who are poor spiritually, those who are poor as far as economically, just being a blessing to people in whatever way we can. So the celebration turns into action as far as as we remember it, it turns into action. And... Uh, it makes an impact in the lives of others. So personal application, questions we ask as we've pondered this. A D-Day of sorts has taken place via the cross and resurrection of Christ. As a result, we can experience the four victorious themes that we highlighted. Regarding theme number one, power. All the power we need for life and for godly living has been given to us through Christ. Are we walking in that power? It's available to us. Power to say no to sin, even the most nasty of sins. We have an ability to say no that we did not have before becoming a believer. And power to do what God wants us to do. If he wants us to do something that's really amazing and like, how could I ever do that? He gives us power to do the things he's called us to do. Regarding theme number two, triumph. We've been given victory through Christ. And we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. If we've stumbled, are we willing to victoriously get back up again? Each one of us stumble at times. Are we willing to get back up or are we groveling in the dirt of the stumble? If we've been given a seemingly impossible task by God to accomplish, are we willing to focus on his ability as opposed to our inability? He's got unlimited ability In each one of us, we can do nothing without abiding in Christ. We can do nothing. Regarding theme number three, celebration, are you and I continuing to gladly receive God's word? Just like the 3,000 who gladly received uh, Peter's word that wonderful day of Pentecost. Are we learning how to rejoice in the Lord constantly? Kinds of things that Paul had lived and was sharing and exhorting the folks in Philippi to do, to rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice, rejoice. Are we learning how to rejoice even when we don't feel like it? It's like by faith, I'm going to rejoice. I'm choosing to rejoice. It's not a fake thing. I am aware of pain or aware of feeling bad, and yet I'm choosing to rejoice in the Lord, not in the circumstances, but in the Lord. And then lastly, regarding theme number four, remembrance. Are we regularly remembering what Christ has done for us? Celebrating communion, thanking him for answered prayer, and abiding in Christ throughout the day, remembering just how awesome he is. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for the things that you accomplished for us on the cross. And thank you for rising again from the dead. Thank you for making forgiveness possible. Thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit. And thank you for the opportunity to live with incredible power that we did not have before. And Lord, for anyone who is listening to this teaching, who has yet to come to a place of faith in you, may that person desire to be saved from this perverse generation. May that person gladly receive you, the Lord Jesus, into his or her heart. And Lord, have a new life, a wonderful life, with your power and bringing you glory. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.